revised transcript. Yes, working as a delivery driver was dreadful. The job entailed long hours under impossible deadlines, creating a stressful environment. The management was unforgiving, harshly criticizing us when their often unreasonable standards weren't met. My friends and family noticed the toll it took on me and urged me to find another job. But I never heeded their advice. The need for money was pressing, and job opportunities were scarce at the time. Eventually, I did leave, but not for the typical reasons. My story begins on a day that started like any other. It was an early start at 6 a.m., so I chugged my coffee en route to the warehouse, watching the sun rise on the horizon. That day's shipments promised a long shift ahead. I was assigned the route through more rural areas, which I loathed. These routes had fewer packages and stops, but the distances between each delivery were greater, meaning more driving time. After refilling my coffee cup and water bottle, I hit the road. The morning began in a suburb, fairly routine. I encountered many dogs barking and some apartments with elusive front doors that required a bit of searching. It was a usual morning until I started delivering to the more remote areas. The distances between stops grew, and I relied on a playlist of old school rock to keep me going. The route eventually led me deep into the woods, to a particular house. This house was guarded by tall black metal gates, adorned with cobwebs intricately woven into the metalwork. After ringing the doorbell, the gates eerily creaked open. The house itself was concealed by tall trees at the top of a hill. It was a dark mansion, reminiscent of the Adams family residence, with crows and a large black mastiff chained to a post dominating the front yard. The dog, unfazed by the crows, watched me intently. I had multiple large packages for this house, requiring several trips to the front porch. Each time, the dog growled menacingly. After placing all the boxes, I sought a doorbell but found none. Instead, there was a grotesque lion statue holding a metal ring in its mouth. I knocked three times and hastily left. Back in my van, I drove away swiftly with the gates slowly opening. However, I didn't get far before my tire blew out. With no phone service and my next stop 15 miles away, the eerie mansion, less than a mile behind, seemed like my only option for help. Reluctantly, I returned. As I approached the black double doors of the mansion, the gate swung open just wide enough for a person to pass through. I reached for the lion's ring, but before I could knock, the door opened. A tall, broad man stood there, his deep voice inquiring, Can I help you? Yes, sorry to bother you, I replied, explaining my predicament and requesting to use a phone. The man sighed deeply and invited me in. The interior was dim and musty. He mentioned he needed to find his phone and would be back shortly, instructing me to wait in the foyer. He wasn't gone for long when a woman appeared around the corner. She was stunning, with deep blue eyes and long brown hair. Her voice was as gentle as her appearance. I'm Marcus, my car broke down, I explained. She approached me, her touch light on my chest, offering a tour. Her gaze was mesmerizing and I found myself unable to articulate a response. She guided me by the hand towards the stairs. My husband, I assume, told me to wait in the foyer, I mentioned, but she dismissed it, saying he would forgive me. As we ascended, I kept looking back, anxious about her husband returning. She led me into a luxurious bedroom. Just as I was about to explain my situation, the husband appeared. Enraged, he stormed over, separating us. I raised my hands in defense, 
insisting it wasn't my intention to engage with his wife. Despite my protests, he dragged me down the stairs to a dark room that resembled a torture chamber, filled with an array of menacing weapons. He restrained me to a table, ignoring my pleas for help with my car tire. His wife circled the table, her giggles ominous. I struggled against the bindings, which were not very tight. The man prepared a selection of knives and scissors, instructing his wife to remove my pants. He proclaimed that seducing another's wife was an abomination deserving punishment, and brandished a large pair of shears, threatening my manhood. In a desperate bid for freedom, I managed to free my hand and slapped him, causing enough distraction for me to seize a knife from his table. As he lunged at me, I stabbed his arm, allowing myself a moment to free my legs, grab my pants, and flee. The wife, no longer laughing, tried to block the door, but I pushed past her and ran for my life down their long driveway. As I reached the gate, I put on my pants and squeezed through the bars. I hitchhiked back to the warehouse. My supervisor, disbelieving my story, fired me on the spot for losing a van full of packages. But honestly, I wasn't even upset. After that ordeal, I was ready to quit. My husband, Richard, often bought things on Amazon, mostly sports memorabilia, and gifts for me and his family. Continued transcript revision. Every few days, a new box or two would arrive on our doorstep. Richard, my husband, was usually fine with me opening the boxes before he returned from work. We had no secrets between us. However, one day, he mentioned a special package due that afternoon and strictly instructed me not to touch it. Assuming it was an anniversary gift, I promised to leave it be. The package was about the size of a microwave. Despite my curiosity, I respected Richard's request and left it on the doorstep. Uncharacteristically, Richard texted me at 5.15 p.m. saying he had to work late and spend the night at the office. He had never done this before. And what's more, his message lacked his usual emojis. I texted back, asking if everything was okay, and received a terse, fine, in reply. When I mentioned bringing in his package, he immediately responded in all caps, instructing me not to touch it. Trying to distract myself, I spent the evening watching TV and went to bed early, but I couldn't sleep. My mind was on Richard. Around 10 p.m., the porch lights which were motion activated, turned on. Initially, I thought Richard had returned, but he usually used the garage entrance. Curious, I went to the living room and saw through the window a tall, thin man crouched over the package on our porch. Acting impulsively, I flung open the front door and confronted him. He was wearing a ski mask, and as he grabbed the partially opened box, he fled, despite the man's size and my usual inclination for caution. I chased him, driven by a determination to protect what my husband worked so hard for. I managed to tackle him to the ground, prying the package from his grasp. As I was about to call the police, he yelled out, Wait! I demanded to know who he was. He began to remove his ski mask. I recognized the unmasked man as someone familiar, possibly one of Richard's employees. His name was Thomas, Richard's accountant. He claimed to have uncovered a horrifying plan. Richard was plotting to blow up their office building. According to Thomas, no one believed him when he tried to raise the alarm, so he took action himself. When I inquired about the relevance of our Amazon package, Thomas urged me to examine its contents. Inside, I found various metal components and technical equipment, unrecognizable to me. 
Thomas alleged these were materials for constructing a bomb. He explained that Richard's company was in severe debt, and in a desperate bid to avoid bankruptcy, Richard had planned to destroy the building, pin the blame elsewhere, and profit from the insurance. This plan didn't account for the potential harm to employees present at the time. I struggled to reconcile this accusation with the man I knew. Richard, in my mind, was incapable of such an act. Yet Thomas's earnest demeanor suggested he was telling the truth. He asked me for the box, insisting he needed to destroy it. I questioned him about Richard's whereabouts. And after some hesitation, Thomas admitted he had restrained Richard in his office, planning to take the bomb materials to the police. Conflicted but inclined to believe Thomas, I decided the only way to uncover the truth was to confront Richard directly. Clutching the package, I drove hastily to Richard's office. The building was deserted. I entered and made my way to Richard's office. Upon opening the door, I found Richard tied to a chair, drenched in sweat. He expressed relief at my arrival, but became visibly anxious when he noticed the open package in my arms. He urged me to untie him, promising to explain everything. On his desk, I noticed. Continued transcript revision. Discovering the building layout with a marked spot for the bomb confirmed Thomas's allegations. I was appalled by the reality of Richard's plan. Despite his pleas, I left him there and immediately went to the police station. Thomas was already there, speaking with a skeptical officer. I presented the box of bomb-making materials and corroborated Thomas's story. The officer took detailed notes and dispatched officers to apprehend Richard. I thanked Thomas for his intervention, albeit unconventional, acknowledging the potential lives he saved. My name is Rebecca, and I'm 18 years old. I've been babysitting to save money for college. One day, my neighbor Linda asked me to watch her son, Matthew, for the weekend. I agreed, despite not knowing her well. Linda handed me a printed list of house rules when I arrived including numerous alleged food allergies for Matthew and strict instructions for his care. No TV, music, or loud noises. She made me sign the list, and I regretted accepting the job almost immediately. After Linda left, Matthew relaxed, and we enjoyed our time together, playing with Legos and throwing a baseball outside. When Linda returned, she interrogated me about the evening. I recounted the activities honestly. She paid me, and I left. The next morning, Linda called me furious. I was baffled as to why, continued transcript revision. Linda's behavior escalated dramatically the next morning. She accused me of harming her son, showed me photos of Matthew's minor knee scrape, and created a scene outside my house. My parents intervened, but Linda left with a threat, heightening the absurdity of the situation. Over the following week, I noticed Linda's hostile glares whenever our paths crossed. Despite my polite gestures, her animosity seemed to grow. Then, on the following Saturday, Linda unexpectedly showed up at my doorstep with a sinister smile, a rope, and sandpaper in hand. Before I could react, she pushed past me, forcefully tied my hands, and pinned me down. She accused me of hurting her son, and announced her intention to retaliate by using sandpaper on my knee. Her actions were unhinged. She began to rub the sandpaper against my skin, initially causing only minor discomfort but I feared it would soon become much worse. Linda's vengeful fixation on a minor injury her son had sustained was beyond comprehension. She was intent on inflicting serious harm in return. 
her actions driven by a disturbing sense of retribution. I struggled beneath her, desperate to escape the escalating pain and her increasingly unstable behavior. As Linda mercilessly scratched my skin, I begged her to stop. She leaned in, whispering chillingly about evening the score, when suddenly, a knock at the door interrupted her. Expecting Trina, I yelled for help, but to my surprise, it was Matthew accompanied by two policemen. Matthew had bravely called 911, foreseeing his mother's extreme actions. The police promptly intervened, pulling Linda off me and leading her away. Matthew apologized for his mother's behavior, and I commended him for his courage. After the incident, Linda faced legal consequences for assault and lost custody of Matthew, who went to live with his father in another state. My injury healed quickly, and though I continued babysitting, I became more cautious about accepting jobs. Moving on to another story, my name is Milton, and I'm 30 years old. A few years ago, I rented a house in the woods through Airbnb for a weekend getaway with my girlfriend, Amanda, and our dog, Spiff. We were looking forward to a peaceful and romantic retreat, especially since both Amanda and I loved winter. Arriving on a Friday evening, we found the house small but cozy with a welcoming fireplace. The plan was simple, relax by the fire on the first day then explore the outdoors the next. As Amanda prepared food, I got the fire going, embracing the rustic atmosphere. However, our dog Spiff was eager to go outside. Reluctantly, I agreed to let him out, despite my reservations about the unfamiliar wilderness at night. Amanda reassured me, noting the absence of dangerous predators in the area. With no other option, and trusting Spiff's instincts, we decided to let him venture out. In the midst of the night, a disturbing bark echoed through the woods, signaling trouble for Spiff. Determined to find him, I armed myself with a shotgun and ventured into the dark forest, Amanda's anxious voice fading behind me as she secured the door. Navigating the dense woods, I followed the distressing sounds of Spiff's barks, which abruptly ceased, heightening my concern. Hoping he had merely fallen into a hole, I pushed through the underbrush, trying to remain hopeful. Suddenly, the eerie stillness was shattered by sinister laughter, and the horrifying realization that Spiff's decapitated head had been thrown at me. Panic set in as howls resonated around me, and a tall, man-like figure with red eyes emerged, chasing me with a mix of wolf-like howls and a human gait. In a desperate attempt to fend off this nightmarish creature, I fired my shotgun into the air, but it relentlessly pursued me. Racing back towards the house, I screamed for Amanda to open the door. As I neared the safety of the cabin, leaving the forest's ominous shadows behind, I was shocked to find. As I staggered into the house, I was met with two shocking sights. First, the door was ajar, and then, turning back, I realized the creature had vanished, possibly deterred by my gunfire. However, the relief was short-lived as I discovered the interior in chaos. Furniture overturned, glass shattered. The most horrifying discovery was Amanda, lifeless on the floor, her body marred by vicious bite marks, surrounded by a pool of blood. Human footprints stained the bloody scene. Overwhelmed with grief, I called the police, who arrived after an agonizing hour. I recounted the harrowing events to them. Later, as they searched the woods, finding only remnants of Spiff, 
one older officer pulled me aside for a private conversation. He revealed local legends from his childhood in a nearby town. Tales of a dogman, a creature part dog, part human. Although he had tried to dismiss these stories as figments of imagination, the description I provided matched the mythical creature from his past. The officer's admission added a chilling layer of mystery to the traumatic events of the night. The officer's words resonated with a grim finality. The creature chasing you is responsible for the deaths of your dog and Amanda. The footprints we found, both inside the house and in the surrounding area, are unmistakably human. We'll do our best to find whoever, or whatever did this. I'm deeply sorry for your loss. This is a complete tragedy. Months passed, yet the mystery remained unsolved. The story garnered media attention, with articles and TV reports speculating about the cryptic legend of a dogman residing in the woods. The evidence was baffling and left more questions than answers. Some believed in the legend, but for me, the truth mattered little compared to the irrevocable loss of Amanda and Spiff. Haunted by the events, I vowed never to venture into a forest again. The weight of guilt, though irrational, was a heavy burden. The tragedy left an indelible mark on my life, a stark reminder of the unpredictability and fragility of existence.